Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I am doing fantastic today, Tim, mostly because we have the return of one of those guests that had joined us numerous times back in the day. We're upwards to about half a dozen, I believe, appearances by this individual. That makes me feel really good. I hope everyone out there is feeling really good. And Tim, I want to return to knowing how your mood is. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. Thanks a lot for asking. And yeah, we have old friend Mike Morford back on, the true crime guy, affectionately known as Morph on these airwaves and beyond. He is the host of The Murder in My Family, Missing Persons, a couple of great podcasts, also Criminology he co-hosts as well. So make sure to check those out. And you can check out everything Morph's up to at abjackentertainment.com. But Lance, in this episode, we speak with Mike about two very mysterious cases. One is the disappearance of Lee Ochi from Tupelo, Mississippi on August 27th, 1992. And the other is the murder of Liz Barraza, who was shot in Tomball, Texas, outside of her residence on January 25th, 2019. Two unsolved cases and totally mysterious. They're both super haunting. And while we love having Morph back on the show, of course, we have to talk about these true crime stories. And what he brings are two, again, of the most haunting stories that... I think we've come across in a long time. Liz Barraza's circumstances, you can watch play out through a couple of different videos that come from home security cameras like Ring cameras. And just a warning, one of them is an angle where you see her get shot. And the individual who shoots her will rattle around in your brain for weeks and weeks to come. I can't emphasize enough that you should approach that video with caution. And the story of Lee Ochi is haunting in a way where it's, I don't know if you got the same sense, Tim. It was really reminiscent to to my childhood and people that I grew up with who would be home alone when they were in their early, early teens, 13, 14, 15, parents worked, maybe you're sick from school or something like that, or it's a holiday, but these things that can happen to somebody, and then the story plays out in this really, again, haunting, disturbing way. So two incredible crime stories that Morph brings to the table that we're very happy to introduce to our audience who may have never have heard of these previously. And in the case of Elizabeth Barraza, you can submit a tip to Crime Stoppers of Houston. That's 713222 tips, which is 8477. And there is a $50,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of Liz Barraza's killer. And if you have any information in the disappearance of Lee Ochi, please call the Tapello Police Department at 662-841-6491. All right, we're going to break for a quick commercial, and we'll be right back with old friend Mike Morph Morford. Thanks to our sponsors, and now we're back to the program. Welcome back to Crawl Space. Mike Morford, how the heck are you today? I'm doing good. I'm back here to uh, build on my record of appearances on your show. Hopefully I still have the record. I don't know. Maybe you've had a lot of people on since me. It's been a while. It has been too long, Morph. You're right about that. I would have to check the tally, but you're definitely still close, if not still the leader, uh, as far as guest appearances on Crawl Space goes. Is this the sixth time? Because I, I, I thought you were at five. It feels like the first time. It always feels like the first time with you, Morph. <laughs> it's like the Foreigner song. Feels like the first time. Wow. A Foreigner deep cut reference. I love it. I love it. How have you been? You're looking healthy. Yeah, I think it's at Florida living. How, how are you doing? Oh, it, we're soaking in the sun down here. It's uh, it's amazing. Although it was chilly t yesterday. I think it was 58 or something like that. Oh, cut the crap, Morph. Wow. How did you manage? <laughs> I poked my head out there. It was a little chilly. I was like, I'm going to stay inside today. It was great to see you at CrimeCon, just a uh, hop, skip, and a jump from where you live now down in Florida. Tell us what you've been working on, and also please refresh our listeners' memories on what shows you do. Well, I've got a lot of shows like you guys. I'm always staying busy and have different things in the fire at any time. I have a network, Abject Entertainment. People can check out at Abject entertainment.com basically have a whole host of podcasts that i either host co-host produce co-produce so there's a lot of shows there all kinds of different true crime of course i have criminology that's the uh og 
podcast that I worked on and I'm still working on. I think we're coming up on 300 episodes, so just keep him busy. I'm curious about one thing. If you had to deviate from the true crime genre and create a new show that was in a completely different genre, what would you go with? I thought about this a million times. I'd love anything football, fantasy football, football betting, anything football. And then um, I'm a huge music fan. I'd love to do a series on the British Invasion. I'd love to do an entire podcast series on the British Invasion because I'm a, I'm a huge fan of that. And then also movies. We've talked some horror movies, and that's something I love in my spare time is watching horror movies. So something along those lines, I think, would be my few things that I'd try and do outside of the true crime space. Any horror movies that you've seen recently that you want to talk about right now? Because we're always down to do that. Not any good ones. It's hard to get some good ones. I, I keep saying I'm going to watch The Exorcist one, but I haven't gotten around to it. And then I heard some reviews that I'm not missing much. And I'm old school. I like to go back and, and watch some good horror movies when they made some real good stuff and didn't didn't have to turn to the CGI to, to make it good. They just told a good story and every once in a while they threw you a jump scare. I can't wait to see Thanksgiving. I got to see that as soon as it comes to VOD. Looks like a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. I saw the first preview for that one. All I know is the tagline for Thanksgiving is probably the most brilliant tagline in horror movie history. There will be no leftovers. <laughs> oh, jeez. I think they've got to get Tim involved in one of these projects. What do you think? I mean, you've got the, the resume with your character from the past, so you might be a shoo -in. Well, yeah, Pan-Man was quite, uh, w was invo evoked a little bit during that trailer, that Thanksgiving trailer when he's using uh, cooking objects to kill people. I got a little jealous, I'll be honest. He moved into your territory a little bit. If he would have <laughs> a picked up like a, a, a pan and put it on his head or something, that would have been too much. <laughs> oh, boy, that would really cross the line. What would you have done? I mean, that that would just be too wild of a coincidence, right? Yeah, probably. <laughs> if, if they put the pan on, on his head as the mask. I mean, it's, yeah, I guess so. They always rip off the classics. Yeah. <laughs> Morph, you've been covering crime for a long time now, and uh, you sent us a couple of cases. I always like to cover stuff on criminology, especially, you know, because it's a little bit different than my other shows. Other shows are very focused on certain niches, but criminology, we do a variety of stuff. And a lot of times it's cases that have made the news or cases that people are talking about on Reddit and web sleuths and stuff like that. And, and cases that really appeal to me. A lot of people out there don't like unsolved cases, but I'm a huge unsolved case fan. Something about the mystery, not knowing and trying to piece those puzzle pieces together to figure out what happened appealed to me. And, and we've done a couple good ones recently on criminology and a couple of the ones we had talked about were Leah Ochi and Liz Barraza. Those were two of the pretty big cases that get a lot of attention online and, and they're really interesting to sort of dissect. And is that how you got the information for these two? Is it something that came to you online or were you doing like Google searches? How did you get these two stories? I'll spend a lot of time just diving into Reddit, web sleuth, see what people are talking about and then I'll go a little bit further and I'll, I'll find some YouTube videos and just sort of skim what they have to say and when something really hooks me i'll go start doing my own research and and really digging in and and these were a couple that were really fascinating yeah this liz barraza case really stuck out to me obviously because of the video there's a couple of angles of a surveillance video of her murder one where you can see the the killer or kind of make out what you're looking at but there are two angles to it yeah it, it sort of rivals the delphi murders when there was video audio you know some kind of evidence of the killer but yet the case goes unresolved for so long you know obviously it looks like that case is is getting some resolution but liz has hasn't and you know for those that don't know her case you can always go back and listen to criminology or my other podcast the murder of my family i spoke with her parents too afterwards she was gunned down in front of her home having a garage sale one morning and surveillance footage picked up the murder and his get his or her I should say getaway vehicle and they have a good idea of it's a it's a black Nissan truck and the footage is grainy so they don't know much beyond that but it's a tantalizing enough clue that you think it would have led to an arrest by now and and it hasn't so it's it's really frustrating from that standpoint yeah and this isn't a very old 
unsolved homicide. This happened in 2019, correct? Yeah. So, I mean, it's not like we have to go back and rely on old stuff. I mean, this is fairly recent. If it happened, you know, back in the 70s or 80s, you know, the person would have gotten away without much to go on because everybody has a home security system almost. It was captured and they pieced together what direction it went and they had a good idea of of the vehicle obviously they even down to the to the model they thought it was a Nissan Frontier so uh, a pretty strong start but then it just sort of fizzled out and then part of the the issue is the footage is grainy it's also captured on her ring doorbell and you you can hear the exchange although it's a little bit garbled because the microphones on those aren't great. They're not designed specifically with collecting quality sound in mind. But you can hear some kind of interaction, and then you hear the gunshots. And in the video, you can clearly see the person just walks right up to her and pulls a gun. And there's some kind of exchange. There's uh, some words spoken. It looks like one of the things I speculated on, it looks like the killer hands her something, and she takes it and then is shot immediately multiple times and they stand over and shoot her a final time and then they flee in this truck and one of the mysteries is it is it a man or a woman because it appears to be somebody that's wearing some kind of gown or some kind of robe or dress or something people have pointed out that they also have a you know some manly type qualities so it's not quite sure if it's a man or a woman you know a man dressed as a woman they're not sure what they're seeing because of the, the video quality and you know it just so happened that liz was also involved in the star wars community dressing up and stuff in that community so some people have even said maybe it's some kind of star wars costume so really just not a lot to go on and other than this little bit of footage and audio and it just unfortunately hasn't led to any arrest it's crazy when you have to say like not a lot to go on and we're talking 2019 everyone has got ring cameras. This person's truck was captured. This person's image was captured. This person fired several shots. Ballistics could lead to something. Where do you think the drop-off is in the investigation that forces you to say, despite everything that we see, there's little to go on? By all accounts, everybody loved Liz. She was popular. She volunteered at hospitals, helped sick kids out, had no known enemies, had a good relationship with her husband. They scoured his social media, his phones, their financial records. There's no history of any affairs. There's no history of any abuse. Financially, they were well off. Nothing at all as far as a red flag for a motive. And, you know, another interesting thing is her husband had left for work a minute before that truck showed up, almost as if they knew when he was leaving. They drove right over and they had been parked right down the road and surveillance cameras from that area captured the vehicle before it drove to her house. So almost right away when when he went by, and I'm, I'm assuming that he drove by them, and that's how they knew he left. They immediately headed to her house and shot her. Also interesting is that truck was captured in the neighborhood at like two o'clock that morning, driving past her house, maybe to see what vehicles were out front, that kind of thing. So they knew apparently that they'd have their opportunity that morning. But what's also interesting is this garage sale she was having was sort of impromptu. It wasn't on social media. It wasn't well planned out in advance. They sort of threw some signs up the night before and that was it. So, you know, nothing really screams one person or another, no known enemies, and and just no real direction to go. And I think that's part of the problem. The husband's still fallen under suspicion by some people, you know, because naturally when somebody's killed in this manner, the closest people to them are often looked at. He's taken multiple polygraph test and cooperated with police. And as far as anybody knows, there's nothing linking him to the case at all. I think the failure for a clear motive is really what's hurting this case. And then on top of that, we don't know if it's a man or a woman driving that truck. We don't know if they own that truck, they borrowed it, they rented it. Who knows? You know, we just don't know much. There's no DNA because the gun that was used was a revolver. It, so it, it didn't eject a cartridge. So without leaving anything at the scene for them to test physically, although there's been some speculation that perhaps, uh, and this hasn't been confirmed by police, but perhaps the person handed her a note, which is what it looks like something's being handed to her in the video, but that police haven't released whether that's the case or not. So just not a lot of physical evidence and no clear motives. Yeah, it looks like Liz kind of takes a step back in the video. I don't necessarily see her reaching towards the person approaching her. I see her taking a small step back, but not a full panic, it seems like. That's the thing, though. If if a, a bunch of people look at it, everybody sees something a little bit different. Like when the person pulls a gun out, you can see their right hand with the gun, and she jumps back, startled naturally. But then she sort of calms for a second and... 
like you mentioned, she's not like r- trying to run away or anything. It's almost like something shocked her, like stopped her in her tracks besides the gun. And if you look closely, the person that, you know, obviously they're holding the gun in their right hand. It looks like their left arm comes up and her right arm goes out. So I personally think that they handed her something. But again, that's that's the whole thing with this looking at it on with grainy video, two people can see two different things. If they didn't hand her anything, then there's no real physical evidence. So they just basically shot and left and and nothing left behind as far as physical evidence that we know. And what a sad story. And you spoke with her parents. Can you elaborate a little bit on that conversation? And what did they have to say about that day and the events that were, I guess, leading up to that garage sale? They're very guarded and they don't talk to a lot of people. As a matter of fact, I had reached out to them to let them know that I was going to be covering the case and I wanted to see if they had wanted to have any kind of role in it or any participation and they didn't get back to me. And then I did it and they listened and then they reached back out to me and they were like, you did a fantastic job. It was excellent. It was spot on. They did correct one or two little things that were off. Like one of the questions was, did she call out that morning and just say she was sick and then have the sale or did she arrange it in advance? And she had arranged the day off in advance from work to have this sale. They just wanted to clarify a couple things. They have, you know, a website set up for her case that is methodically detailed with factual information and not speculative stuff. And they were happy that we use that sort of as a uh, as a guideline instead of just making our own assumptions and making wild leaps and stuff. And I think they respected that. So I, I opened up a really good dialogue with them. We got to talking and I probably talked with them for three or four hours and, and got a lot of it on audio so much that I made a two-part episode on the murder of my family. So the victim impact is important to them. They want to help other people, number one. They don't really get into the theories so much. They don't really go down that that road. They're more worried about, obviously, than what the person caught, but they also want to figure out how they can help other people in their shoes. But that day, you know, they sort of backed up the fact it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't like a a major event that this was some monster garage sale that was going on. It was just sort of casual, planned out. Like I said, they threw out signs the night before. They didn't put anything on social media. Her father was supposed to come over there. I can't remember exactly what happened off the top of my head, but I think he was running late or he decided not to go. I can't remember which, but he would have been there and he says that he carries and he says he doesn't know what would have happened. I mean, he might have been shot too, but he said he would have definitely tried to protect her the best he could. So I think that gnaws at him a little bit too, that he could have been there and maybe he could have made some kind of difference. We'll we'll never know, but I think that weighs on him a lot. Yeah, I could see that. You mentioned that the truck was in the neighborhood much earlier, around uh, 2 a.m. Can you tell us a little bit more about the behavior of the truck before the shooting? Yeah, just casually driving through the neighborhood. It drives right past their house and slows down. To me, it's pretty clear they're casing that house. Not a random house, that particular house? I think they're casing that house and they drive by and then they turn back out and go back out of the development. And then a few hours later, they're there shooting Liz specifically. And that's why I think they were looking at her house specifically, probably to see if I had a guess what vehicle her husband was driving. So they would know when he left work, they would see it and say, okay, he's gone. Let's go over there and do this. That's what I, my guess would be. And, you know, he drove out of the development and drove past the spot they would have been laying in wait. And when they saw him, they drove right over and and did what they did. So they had left the neighborhood for a while and then came back. Do you know how long they were waiting there, I guess, for the husband to maybe drive by to sort of cue them? Several minutes. I don't know the exact timeline off the top of my head, but they were there for several minutes. And what's interesting is Liz had run out that morning earlier and gone to a local Dunkin' Donuts or, or something or Starbucks or something and picked up a coffee and then come home. You know, if they were there and they saw her out they could have done this while she was out and about so they either weren't there yet or they just didn't want to do that at that moment Uh, instead they waited for her husband to leave specifically before they went to her house and, and did this to me it's clear it's it's a clear case of she was the intended target you know they had an idea of when they'd be able to strike and do this it was a very small window and then they went there and and did it immediately now what's interesting is they drove back further into the development and then they turn around and drive back by the house some people have speculated this because 
they want to make sure she's dead. But I personally think they may have been lost. They may have panicked and drove further into the development where there's no exits and then turned around and came back out and drove by. And they went by because the first thing, it's seven o'clock, people are getting ready for work. So they hear these gunshots, they look out the window, and sure enough, the truck's driving back by when they're looking out the window. In addition to the cameras, you've got the people telling the police it was a black Nissan because they saw it go back by and it just confirmed with the surveillance. So that's speculation there is that they turn around because they wanted to see that for sure that she was dead or was it because they had gotten lost and then had to drive back out. But the problem is when they drove back that other way, coming back by, they went into another part where there was no exit from. So if you track the area and you look at the maps, they didn't come back out. They went down to a cul-de-sac and never came back out. So the only choices were, you know, they either parked in one of the garages on this road or they drove out and above there's a um there's a you know grass field and, and that kind of thing i think they just drove across that and went out of the development and onto the highway and, and police said they did track the truck tracked it so far so i think they did determine it went out onto the highway they've never said that though but interestingly which is uh something that's they haven't made a lot of information available they pulled over a truck that matched the description within minutes of the shooting. And the explanation is that the person had a good reason to be there and nothing was suspicious. You know, I'm, I'm hoping they didn't slip up and somehow let this person go after pulling them over. Just because they had a reason to be in the area doesn't mean they didn't do it. You know, black Nissan Frontier. And they did pull a truck over that matched that description, but they let the driver go. So I hope they've crossed their T's and dotted their I's and made sure this person wasn't involved. Because that's a pretty rare truck compared to, you know, sales-wise. There's all kinds of Fords and Chevys in Texas. There's not nearly as many Nissans. I think you know, that truck being in that area at that time is, is pretty compelling. Now you've said development that this was like a community development. That, was it like a gated type community? No, not gated, but there, it's one of those ones where you know, sort of cookie cutter. You've got all these different streets that sort of wind through, but there's only, you know, a couple ways in or out really. So sort of that kind of layout to go out through the road to get back out of the development onto the main highway, they would have had to have come back down uh, after passing that second time, but they never came out of there. So the only options were they went down and parked in one of the garages on that street, or they drove across that field and back out onto the highway, um, which I, I think is probably the most likely scenario. That's so weird. And Unless they were planning to drive through the field, it strikes me as really bad planning on the part of the, the killer, which makes me question casing the neighborhood in the first place. Like that, They did a pretty bad job of that. Like, how sure are you that this was targeted and not random? You've got them the night before looking at the area. You've got them heading to her house one minute after the husband leaves. And just knowing that that minute right there, I find it weird that somebody would just randomly pick the minute after the husband left to just go to a random house. They knew he was leaving. They couldn't see the house from the, where their, their vantage point. So it's not like they saw a woman out there and just say, oh, that woman there is alone. Let's go shoot her. They knew the, the van. They knew that the vehicle was leaving at a certain time. And as soon as it drove by, they headed right over to her house. So to me, I don't question for a second that she was the target. The only question to me is why was she the target and who's involved? And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors, and now we're back to the program. There was no evidence of anything missing or stolen. Did she have any history with any sort of like organization, any group of people, anything that might have some sort of element of danger to it? Nothing. Zero. Again, the volunteer at the hospital for kids. In her spare time, she loved making costumes and, and doing these cosplay things for Star Wars community. No connections to any violent people. No criminal records for anybody in her family. Really nothing to grasp at. If there's one thing to, to point at to say, hey, this is interesting, you know, it might open up a, an avenue to go down, but there's literally nothing. Now, in the shortly before uh, she was killed, a gunshot was fired into her work. There wasn't much said about it or what it involved, what it entailed, and it could have been just random. It was just something that, you know, looking back is interesting, but there's no evidence that it was specifically targeted to her. It looked more of a, a random shooting, um, but it's just hard to, to not look at 
leading up to the to the murder. It was a gunshot that happened at her work, like at her hospital. She didn't work at the hospital. She volunteered there, volunteered her time, like oh, cheering okay. up sick kids. But she worked in sort of a professional type of place, a company that had some kind of warehouse, I believe, or office building of some type. So it was sort of more or less a a, a bullet just being fired into the building itself. And there was one little interesting thing when they asked her husband to think of anything, anything at all, any reason at all that somebody might have a, a grievance with her over anything, no matter how small. The only thing he could think of was somebody was angry within the Star Wars community that she was a member of. She was one of the people in charge of, forgive me, I don't know all the lingo and stuff because I'm not in that community, but somebody was unhappy with one of the decisions she made about their standing in the club or something along those, those lines, and they had a beef with her. Now, this person was supposedly talked to by police and, you know, apparently had no connection to, to the murder, but that's the only person he was able to give them as anybody that she even had remotely... Uh, a grievance with because again there's there's just nothing at all in a full search of her and her husband's lives that point to a suspect the reason that she was having the garage sale in the first place was to get some extra money so her and her husband could go on a trip right yeah so they had an anniversary trip coming up they were going to orlando they were financially well off they they had saved their money they didn't spend a lot of money they were pretty responsible with their earnings and stuff they just said okay you know we'll just have some extra pocket cash we'll get rid of some stuff we don't want anymore and, and just have a little extra cash in the meantime something along those lines how long had they been married i think they were coming up on their fifth year so again just really again no history of violence between them, no domestic abuse, no arguments, no affairs, uh, financially doing well, just no motive at all in the crime. So I think that's what makes it so hard to pinpoint anything to, to go towards. Targeted, but no motive, and she doesn't appear to recognize the shooter. Yeah, that, that sums it up. That's, that sums it up pretty well. Yeah, very perplexing. I have to say that's a reason why I, I would question like this person's, I don't know, how, how hinged they are or aren't. Obviously, they're angry. I don't know. It strikes me as very, uh, very unhinged behavior. Do you know if the police looked into the Star Wars internet group connection? They did. I, I don't know how far they went down that but they you know obviously talked to the person that her husband named as having a run-in with her over this decision she had made and i don't think she was connected to the crime at all they sort of ruled her out you never know what's going to set somebody off you know you never know if somebody slighted if you did something it it might seem trivial but to them it may not be especially if they're unhinged or something is you know, one of the theories is that it's it's a hit a contract hit in some way. But then the question is by who, you know, who benefits? Her husband actually did have a, a, a small life insurance policy, not a, not a huge one, but he apparently, he said publicly that he never even cashed it. He felt people were suspicious of him already and he didn't want to even cash the check because he felt it would make him look even guiltier. Yeah. Well, good on him for that. That was good thinking. Again, just not a real clear motive anywhere around. It's just really frustrating. There's been no sightings of that truck other than that one that they had pulled over and they let the person go. On that, you said that they might have driven through this little field to get to the highway. Where geographically is this in the state of Texas? Like if they get on a highway, are they super close to the next state? So this is Tomball, Texas, and it's outside of Houston. It's not real close to any borders, I don't think. But as far as I know, they did look in adjoining states at black Nissans. They check rentals and they've even gone to Florida to chase down leads. So I know they've really done a lot of stuff trying to figure this out. Unfortunately, just missing that that piece of the puzzle that gives us answers any other random shootings no no other similar crimes i mean people have thrown out crimes that are in general have you know similarity but nothing that you can say is definitely linked to her case did she interact with the public at work I don't know the exact details of what she did, but I don't believe so. I think she was more of a support person for the company itself within. You know, as far as everybody knows, she was getting along with people at work. Um, no run-ins with anyone there. No complaints about anyone, about her or her, about anyone else. You know, no real leads there either. It's really uh, frightening watching the person shoot Liz and then run away like that. It's uh, it's really disturbing. Yeah, and there, there's so many rabbit holes. Like I said, you could sit in a group of 10 people and watch and listen to that and everybody afterwards tell you what they saw and it's something different. You know, three or four people say this, three or four people say this. And that's the problem when, when it's 
grainy quality video and audio. I, I still think that the best lead is is the the black Nissan. I've even you know floated the possibility that hopefully they verified with. 100% certainty that it was a, a Frontier, the smaller Nissan truck, because the difference in wheelbase is minimal between that and a Nissan Titan. They look very similar. This was a Pro 4X off-road model, which is even more distinguishable because of the decals and the package that it has on it and stuff. So it's a very distinct truck. Despite that, it just hasn't led to the, the person being identified. Does her husband still live in the same house? No, he moved and he remarried. I want to say it was two years, but don't, don't hold me to that. And then right away, everyone started accusing him. Oh, he had a secret girlfriend and blah, 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 blah. Well, she supposedly has cooperated with police. She t has taken lie detector test. He claims they met after Liz was killed. Again, unless the police are more suspicious of them than they seem to be, I think they, you know, they pointed out that both him and her have cooperated and have you know, answered questions and taken polygraphs and stuff like that. So unless there's something they're holding back, they don't seem to be involved. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsor. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. All right, Morph. Tell us about this other case you mentioned to us, Lee Marine Ochi. Yeah, so Lee was a 13-year-old daughter. It was her first time staying home on her own. You know, her mom, she's a single mom. Her mom had actually split up with her. I think they were married or, or at least living together. But she had split up with her significant other, you know, several weeks before this incident. And ironically, we're, we're down in the same part of, of, of the country here. But this is, you know, 30 years old, this case. So Lee's basically home alone. Her mom works a mile and a half down the road. Mom claims she went to work that morning. The daughter was excited, you know, sort of excited to be home off of school, number one, because they had some kind of in-school function where there was no school that day. She was excited to, watch, you know, stay home by herself. Mom told her, lock the doors, don't answer the door. You know, if you need me, call me. And then she went to work. But there was a, a hurricane that day in Florida primarily, but the mom was worried that remnants of it would hit them. So she was worried about leaving her home and her daughter, you know, Lee didn't like storms. So she called a few times and, and Lee didn't pick up. You know, she finally got nervous after calling a few times, not getting an answer and drove home. Now this was supposed to be a day, I say she was home alone that day, but her grandmother was supposed to pick her up around lunchtime and uh, they were going to go out and do something related to school. So she was only going to be home really a few hours, you know, within an hour, hour and a half of her getting to work, she's already heading home to check on Lee after not getting the answer. She said when she pulled up, she saw the first thing that concerned her was the garage door was open and the garage door was never open. She also said the light to the in the garage was on, which is motion activated. So she felt the garage door had just open not long before. So she said she went up to the front door, went in. Uh, it was, it was um, shut, but not locked. Uh, she went in and immediately saw signs of a struggle. There was blood in different spots. She called out to her daughter. She's not there. And then as she made her way around the house and verified that Lee wasn't there, she found more spots of blood. And according to her, she's, you know, fearing the worst at this point. And that's when she called the police. This one is like terrifying because I think about all the days that I stayed home from school for whatever reason alone. And what can happen when you're not paying attention when you're not thinking about something that terrifying happened. I mean, it just must have been absolutely terrifying for this poor girl. You know, obviously you sort of want that independence, but at the same time, you know, you, you've got to be on guard. And uh, what 13 year old kid is thinking, okay, I got to make sure that if anybody breaks in, here's what I'm going to do. I don't think 13 year olds are thinking about that. Now I have a 13 year old daughter. And if I go down the road for a mile, I'm like, lock the doors, turn the alarm on. If anything happens, call me, call 911 first. I have a checklist that I go through. Now I'm in a little bit of a different spot because of everything I talk about for a living, but she has a set checklist of what to do if I go out for even five minutes. You know, here's a case where we don't have home security alarms, surveillance video, that stuff's not really available back then. But she said, basically lock the doors, don't answer the door for anyone. And then she comes home and the garage doors open. So it's like, okay, what happened here? Now, was the garage door motorized and could you access the inside of the house from the garage? Like you walk through and it goes to a second door into the house? I don't know if it was motorized or not. That's a good question. I'm assuming it's one of those ones with the light on it. So I'm thinking it probably was. And that's what, you know, and it stays on when the garage door goes up, it'll stay on for five minutes, whatever amount of minutes. 
I'm thinking it was motorized, but I actually don't know offhand if it was motorized. Yeah, and I don't recall if there was a door going into the house, but I know the mom went to the front door to go in. Uh, so not through any kind of door that was connected to the garage. It's interesting. Those motorized ones, you need like a remote or you have a keypad to open it. You know, there's not a lot released by the police about those details. Long story short, there's some things in, in her story that are sort of get checked by police later on. And there's some things about the crime scene that are suspicious. Like the police go there and they look and they find these different blood spots. They find some of her clothes with blood on them. But what they, the police have said publicly is someone had tried to clean up some of the blood, which to me was a major red flag. Because if you're abducting a child out of a house, are you going to try and clean up the crime scene? Or are you going to try and get them out of there as fast as possible before somebody sees you or sees your vehicle outside? So to me, as soon as I heard that fact, that was a red flag to me because I don't think there, somebody's going to be cleaning up a crime scene. So I had an issue with that right away. And I think some other people have had an issue with that as well. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? What does that tell you if someone is cleaning, trying to clean up the crime scene? So to me, it opens up the possibility that something happened to her, somebody tried to clean it up, and then realized halfway through the cleanup, wait a minute, either A, this is too much to clean up and they're going to find it if they look hard enough, or I'm still going to have to explain what happened here to them. So let me stop cleaning and leave this scene here for the police and make it look like she was abducted and something happened. There's no rationale why someone abducting a 13-year-old girl out of her house is going to take the time to clean up a crime scene because it only leads to the possibility that their car outside is going to be seen if they have one, or they're going to be seen the longer they're there. So to me, the whole story of the cleanup thing is very troubling. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Does Hurricane Andrew occurring at the same time have anything to do with her disappearance? I looked at the weather reports that day, and it really wasn't bad at all. It was just a you know, pretty minor wind, and I think there was some light rain. Just very, very outskirts of it. So no, nothing really major as far as the storm itself. Now, to me, the troubling thing, is, too, is the timeline. It's sort of like Liz's case. You know, husband leaves for work and a minute later, somebody shows up. Here, the mom leaves for work. And by the time she's back there an hour, hour and a half later, whatever happened supposedly has already happened and, and they're gone. Was this person, if there was really a person there stalking and knew that they'd have this opportunity to strike at just that time and they were able to get in and get away without being seen? Or did they just get lucky and come along? Or was there a person at all? Those are all the questions I have as to this because there's no other witnesses. They lived on a, a sort of a cul-de-sac. I haven't heard or read anything about neighbors seeing anything or even being home that day to see anything. So no, and, and no surveillance video. So pretty much we're taking the mom's word as far as what she claimed happened that morning. Speaking of the mom, can you describe a little bit of the family dynamic? Lee's mom and dad were married. I, I forget how long they had been divorced for, for a while. He was in the military. He was stationed overseas. And then he came back and he was in Pennsylvania or someplace on the East Coast. I don't remember where. But they didn't live together. But she'd visit him every once in a while and they'd talk on the phone often. The mom had remarried to a guy or living with him. And again, they had split up several weeks before this happened. And that guy was a suspect Obviously, the police talked to him. They wanted to find out, did they leave on good terms? There was allegations that, you know, there was some abuse going on physically. He admitted to the police that he had, I don't know what kind of abuse, if he beat her, smacked her, what, how, what the extent was. But he admitted to physically abusing Lee. But he said he didn't know anything about her being abducted. And he took polygraph test and passed. He had an alibi. Also, Lee's dad took a polygraph test and passed. And he was in another state, so he had an alibi. The only person that didn't pass was the mom. She had three failed polygraph tests. You said three failed? Three failed tests. One by the local police and two by the FBI. I think it was three total with three different polygraph administers. And the FBI was involved with the investigation? At least on the polygraph end of it. I don't know if they were in the investigation themselves. I don't know that offhand. How far they went into it and how they got brought into it. I just know that the local police said, can you do polygraph on your end? And they, they did. And three total tests were given and she failed all three. You'd think after like two, her lawyer would have been like, don't take another polygraph. Well, and I, I don't know that 
she even had an attorney at that time. I, I, you know, obviously attorneys recommend don't even take one because they're not admissible in court. So I think any attorney is going to recommend you don't take one. But she did. She took three and failed three. Has there been any credible sightings? Anything? I know that there was a possible one at a McDonald's drive through uh, can you describe that one and any other ones that might have occurred? Interestingly, that was in a, a town not too far away, that possible sighting of her, and it made the newspapers. It said they were checking a lead in that town after she was seen in a drive through or someone thought they saw her. Police checked it out, and it, they identified the person that was in the truck and the girl, and it wasn't her. Interestingly enough, before they announced that it wasn't her, the mom claimed she received a letter postmarked from that town addressed to her ex that had moved out. And when she opened it up, it had Lee's glasses and were missing her eyeglasses. So this letter came from that town where that sighting was. And the thinking here is that the person says, okay, the police are looking at this possible sighting in this town nearby. I'm going to go there and mail these glasses from there and get them continuing to look at this town as thinking the perpetrators there when they're really not. But they didn't know that the police had already cleared this person, this sighting as not being her from this town. So I think someone was trying to shift the blame and get the police looking continually in that area and not closer to home. So her eyeglasses were sent from that town that the sighting was in. Did they have any um, handwriting analysis or DNA from the envelope? As far as I can remember, no. Um, I don't think they had DNA, and I don't remember the analysis uh, on it. And I don't know how much of that they've actually shared altogether anyway. But that seems to me like those would be two possible areas to, to explore. Now, this is back in the 90s. DNA is in its infancy. So someone sending this stuff in might be careful of not sending prints, but they probably wouldn't be aware of DNA. So you would think that there could be somebody's DNA coming there, you know, maybe a, the letter, the envelope sealed, licked shut or something like that. But as far as I understand, there there was no DNA that they could use. Wow. So strange that the package was addressed to Yarborough, the uh, the stepfather as well. If it had nothing to do with him, it uh, seems like they're trying to absolutely trying to shift blame or throw the investigation in a certain direction. Like you said, they were separated just before the disappearance and this Yarborough died few years later. They had actually divorced a couple years after. Obviously, he admitted that he had physically abused her, but he, you know, he denied having anything to do with her disappearance and had an air, you know, alibi and passed a polygraph. So, you know, you for for what it's worth, that cleared him, I think, to some extent. At the end of the day, you're you're left with this story entirely driven by the mom. You know, everything that we have timeline wise is all from her. We have nobody that saw the daughter alive that morning. We don't have anybody that saw her since the day before. So we're having to take what the mom says and use that information, whether it's correct or not. You know, and I, I'm not afraid to say it. I think for me, this points towards the mom being involved. You know, there's a lot of cases where the parents get the finger pointed at them, and I find a lot of reasons why that's not the case. Likely there is a chance it's someone outside. Here, I just think the attempted cleanup is really what sticks in my mind. I could see her trying to clean it up, doing it on accident, panicking, and then realizing halfway through cleaning it up, wait a minute, do I clean this up or do I use it as part of my cover story here of what's going to happen? Some of the things we don't really know and I don't know how far they really went down this this rabbit hole, but we don't know how fresh the blood was that was found. Could they tell if it was like from that morning or the day before? Those are the things we don't really know. You know, there's a lot of unanswered questions at the police until they come out and clarify some stuff. We just don't know the answer to. Was there anything else missing from her room? No, there was. Um, well, there, there. I, I take that back. There was there was an outfit that she was wearing. The mom said she had last seen her, I think, in a nightgown or something. And that was found in the hamper with blood on it. And when they asked what was missing, she described a, a specific birthday outfit that was missing. If you said, what was my daughter wearing when she left home today? I couldn't tell you. I don't remember what she was wearing. But the mom knowing exactly what outfit's missing out of her closet is pretty interesting in 
in my opinion, because I couldn't tell you if, if my, my wife went missing and you asked me to say what's missing out of her closet, I'd have no idea. You know what I mean? And it was just her birthday. So maybe this was an outfit she had sitting up on the dresser and was ready to wear one day that week. That's how the mom knew she was, it was missing because it was no longer there. I don't know that detail. I just know she described the birthday outfit that was missing. And that was really the only thing that was missing. There was no valuables. There was nothing taken from inside the house as far as we can tell. And so we're assuming that she was wearing that outfit and she had her eyeglasses with her if those positively identified eyeglasses were mailed back. So whoever mailed back those eyeglasses probably knows what she was wearing and probably has other possessions of hers or had. If what the mom's alleging happened that she was abducted from the home, if that's what happened, then yes, somebody out there would know and would have that and you know, I think the likely scenario, if the mom's telling the truth, is someone showed up, made her leave. Maybe she had already changed and put that birthday outfit on. For one reason or another, the, the clothing she was wearing, the nightgown, which had blood on it, was in the hamper. Would they have forced her to change and then get dressed after they've already attacked her because the blood's already on the nightgown? I don't know. How much blood was on the nightgown and where on the nightgown was the blood? That's the thing we don't really know. There were enough that it was noticeable. And there were certain areas. So I think it went down through the kitchen and there was certain areas that had more than the other. So a, a substantial amount of blood, you would think that they're seeing it in these different spots, not a couple drops. If the blood on her nightgown was related to her getting kidnapped or abducted, that's another check in the very, very strange column, right? Like the cleaning up of the blood, because why would someone who's randomly abducting someone bother to throw the nightgown into the hamper exactly or take the time again we're talking you want to get out of there as fast as possible you're not going to tell her hey change and get dressed or why would they take the glasses are they going to care if she can see or not is that something or you know or did she have them on her head or we just don't know what to make of it and what's uh what reality is here that's the, that's the unfortunate part unlike liz's case we have no surveillance or anything to, to solidify any of, of what's being thought here. Was she raised in a strict household or a uh, religious household? They went to church. I don't know how religious they were, which sort of leads into another suspect because there was a guy, he was at the church they went to some point after she was attacked. This guy got in trouble for abducting a teenage girl and then he let her go and they she, you know, she led police right to him. You know, people have thrown his name out there as, hey, he did this after she went missing. So why couldn't he be involved? And supposedly they knew each other from church. And she also went horseback riding at the same stable that he went horseback riding at. If there is a suspect, a lot of people think it could be this guy. But there's just nothing there physically connecting him solidly besides the fact that he did abduct a girl at some point after this. And then there was, you know, a, the whole other thing of some people alleged that the mom may have been involved in some of the physical abuse of Lee too. I think she's pretty much denied that. Friends would say that Lee would show up to school with different bruises and different things on her. And she would always dismiss them as horseback riding things that happened to her. She always had an excuse, but that, you know, her friends all thought, and, and they've said this publicly, some of them, that she was being abused at home, just covering it up with, with a, a story about horseback riding and stuff like that. Well, that is tragic. Uh, sorry to hear that. But Morph, thanks for coming on here and uh, sharing these cases these very suspicious and bizarre cases. Where can our listeners hear uh, more about these? Well, you can definitely go check out Criminology Podcast. Uh, that's out anywhere you want to listen to podcasts. And then you can head over to my site, Abject Entertainment. Dot com And I've got all the website, you know, I've got all the podcast on there, hopefully adding a couple new ones in 2024. So fingers crossed that goes smoothly. Yeah. And if uh, any of these that you brought to us today have any developments, feel free to give us a ring. We'll get you back on to talk about any developments that do happen. And we definitely will not wait as long as we waited in between appearance number five and, and appearance number six. Looking forward to number seven. Nice. Great to I'm, hear I'm rep that. I'm repping the crawl space, guys, uh, every time I drink coffee.